and it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> and I thought, wait a minute, it's, he's just being honest. What had happened was the guy who bought the movie to release it and put it in the theaters and stuff, he did nothing to create a language that people would have even before they saw the movie. You know what I mean? And so his opinion of it, of, according to the budget, it was going to be something you would have to suffer through, right? Because of the project. We raised the money on Kickstarter. And uh, we're one of the few Kickstarters that actually gave everybody exactly what we said we would give them. So everybody was happy about that. And then making the movie, uh, The Sultan of Abu Dhabi, his name is Sultan. But he's a prince in Abu Dhabi. And he decided he wanted to back this movie. So he put another like 600,000 which was cool, you know, I mean, that, that came out of the blue. And uh, we actually made the film, it's about the Bering Sea and ships and the ocean. We actually made it in Chatsworth, California. We had a little warehouse right next to a place that sold carpet, like this kind of carpet. <laughs> and every day we would come in and we'd build the ship, we built it all. All of us worked on it. I used to get there at five in the morning and come and help, put rivets in and do all this stuff. So it, it was a passion film. We all we all wanted to see Alec, the guy who owns uh, ADI, Tom Woodruff and Alec Gillis. We had done Aliens together, Terminator, Pumpkinhead. We had done so many movies together and we've known each other 26 years. And he wrote the script and then we would do read-throughs of the script and change the dialogue, you know, make it balanced and really cool. So what you saw was a passion film. I mean, we, we were determined to make an homage to the 80s films. But we also, uh, we also kind of wanted it to all be practical effects. Everything you saw was miniatures or, or practical effects. So that's pretty cool. I mean, we did it. We pulled it off. It's opening in London. And it seems like the Europeans, it, it opened in Malaysia, other countries. They sold it to a lot of different countries. They are not as hard on that film as Americans are. <laughs> you know what I mean? They, they welcomed it. So, so we're, we're getting the, uh, I, I guess we had a cause celeb because everybody was tired of CG, you know, every, I remember they did, they did the thing, and they did these incredible practical effects things, and they switched them out, the producers switched them out to CG, and it was like an affront, in a way, to anybody that loves to do the art, you know, the art of creating uh, practical effects. So we became like a, a kind of a, taking a stand and when you go on the internet and you read some of the things that were said about it from people that never even saw it you'd be blown away you really would the negativity how dare you, you know? so anyway that's the prelude to this what i can tell you more anybody got a question yeah good um well it's Unrelated to Harbinger Dam, but I just kind of, you know, inquisitive about it. Um, out of all the characters that you played in your lifetime, which one that you played that you can relate to the most? Which what? The character that you played. Which movie? Well, yeah, in any movie like that oh, you played. Well, you're asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> I can't sit behind this table anymore. Man. Sorry. I feel like I want to be part of you guys and not a corporate, a corporate eagle. Um, um, that's a terrible question. <laughs> People always ask me that question, like, what is your favorite movie you've ever done? My answer always is the last one. 
<laughs> That's a good way of getting out of it. <laughs> and yeah, it's pretty true. I mean, the lot. I if I retain very deep memories of every movie I've done, I would probably be a psychopath by now. <laughs> I've done about. They've got me listed as having done uh, 218 movies. You know, little parts, big parts, whatever. You know. And that's like, I don't even bring home the jacket from this movie or, or the prop gun from this movie. I don't do that because it would lock me into the film. I'd never, I'd never be able to get away from it. So the only way to describe my life is I'm like a cat leaving a cat box. <laughs> they don't look bad. <laughs> so, so. Because otherwise, you, you, you can't retain that much. Every movie has scripts that are 120 pages. And you, you have to empty your head. You know, we all go through that. I don't think, you know, my mind is, I, it's talking to itself right now, even though I'm talking to you. <laughs> That's a good question, but did I give you a good answer? <coughs> well, okay. Anybody else? Got something? Yeah? Roger Down, what was the special effects they used for the spores on his face when you got The what? The special effects, you know, they used for the spores on your face. What was that? Do you know what they put on your face? Or Bad skin. What? <laughs> the spores on my face? Yeah, they, that's how you got infected, right? Well, that's part of it, yeah. It was the beginnings of the infection. Oh, okay, yeah. You know, the, the, it's, he wrote such a good script, I thought. Uh, the fact that I, I didn't tell my granddaughter that her grandmother had passed away. And I had her ashes on the ship because I missed her and I didn't want to dump them overboard. And so to have those elements running throughout the movie, which is, I have a secret that I have to tell you eventually. I didn't know this was all going to happen. And the best part of the movie is it happens so quick that nobody can adjust. You know, There's no adjustment in that movie. You just have to fight to stay alive, which is cool. We didn't drag you down. You know the triglycerides, you know, that machine that she was using uh -huh. is absolutely real. It's the newest technology out there. And that company gave us the machine to use. You can, any of us could take a blood test, put it in there, and it would tell you what's going on in your body. It's the latest technology. And here we are using it in Harbinger now. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. But that's what happens to actors. I, I mean, I went, when I played Wally Shalar and the right stuff, my connection with NASA was now sealed. They actually brought me down years later to induct Sally Ride in the Astronaut Hall of Fame. They said, would I moderate it? And so imagine, imagine all of the, the doors that opened to me as an actor that had I not been an actor, maybe just a potter. I would have never known. I would have never seen. I've been to the White House. They don't know who they're letting in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, but I guess it's a miracle a kind of existence. You know what I mean? And I, and I do things to keep grounded, so it's not like I think of myself as anything special. More so that, that we are we all have a story, a life story to tell. In one way or another, it comes out, it has to. I thought of something really cool, that, that, that we are the representative of, I am the representative of my grandfather, his father, my mother and father. I'm the final representative, except for my kids. And now they take that on. I have a 15 year old, I said to her, you know, the only reason they're going to remember me is because of you. And she, she got mad. And I said, what are you mad about? She thought I, I had to, I gave her a job to kind of, to keep my, uh, you know, my, 
the memory of my life going on. I just meant it's cool. You know, you're it. You're the you're the next. She the shit that concerns me. It's like <laughs> I think of shit like this when I'm pumping gas. <laughs> I know we all do. Anyway. Another question. Did I answer your question? No. You answered it. <laughs> I didn't answer it. I have, I'm real slippery. I'm like a, an old eel. Anyway. Yes? Um, you mentioned being a potter, and I heard that you did ceramic work, and I wondered if that informs your love of having built, you know, kind of move away from CGI, but actually physically build things for film. Talk about that a little bit. Did you hear that question? That's pretty good. It's a good question. Yes. The answer is yes. I'm, I'm more prone to that because I started out making my own shoebox in New York to shine shoes because that's where I was raised. And, and I had brass tacks and it looked cool, right? I, I hated school, so instead of going to school, I'd shine shoes and go to movies. So, and, it, and if it was, a, if it was a, a going up river with Kirk Douglas, you know, that kind of movie, I had knapsacks and canteens underneath my seat. So I was like a, a method moviegoer. <laughs> so it started very early. <laughs> I wanted to escape. If I could have just got across the Hudson River, I probably would have ended up here. Kansas, who knows? <laughs> anyway. But yes, uh, pottery is uh, an obsession with me. I've been doing it since 1960. And I never took a class, so I had to rediscover electricity all along the way. And wheel? become a good potter. You, on, you throw on a wheel or do you hand build or both? Everything. Yeah. I do it all. But I don't make cups or goblets. <laughs> I won't do that. <laughs> and I don't sell them, I donate them now. You know, cool. because if I have to sell one thing to make pottery, I'd never do it again. I'd just forget it. Interesting. Yeah. And that's not easy for me, believe me, to, to give it up. But yeah, practical effects are, in fact, they use a lot of the same materials that potters do. Mm -hmm. You know, the silicones and all of these things. And they're, and they're very, very good at it. And they're painters because they, they make it lifelike or whatever. Uh, ADI, which is Alec Gillis and Tom Woodruff's studio, it takes up almost the whole city block. And when they're not doing a movie, uh, people come in and work there and do their stuff, do their own stuff. Anybody else? Yeah. yeah. Uh, for your character in Harbinger Down, uh, we just saw that, by the way. Good effects, but what would you, what was the motivation in your character? Like, did you grab from any? Like, were you inspired by any other like boat captains, or how did you get that like kind of bristly kind of old well, boat captain? Well, before before I was an actor, I went to sea because my father, who I didn't know very well, he was a seaman his whole life. So I went to sea to find out what what his life was, and uh, I didn't like it very much. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, endless hours doing nothing more than eating, you know, <laughs> standing and watch at a wheel, you know, I mean, it was, no matter how big the ship is, it's certainly, the jobs are few, you know, it's a, it runs itself almost. But I had extreme confidence to play Graf because I knew that world. I, I actually got kicked out of Europe once, <laughs> and they, because I was by a river painting, painting pictures, and the cops picked me up because I had no money. I had, I had taken a Yugoslavian freighter to Genoa, Italy, and got off and didn't have any money. And so I'd walk into a restaurant with big walls like this, and I'd say, look, for food, I will paint you a mural. And I would. And they'd give me a little bit of money and a little bit of, you know, I, and as much food as I wanted. But anyway, the cops found me, and they, they didn't like my painting start with. <laughs> they threw me in jail overnight. The next day they put me on a ship to Savannah, Georgia, out of Rotterdam. And uh, that took 30 days. We were dead of winter, 
force 30 wind coming at us. So it took 30 days on this tanker that was carrying sulfuric acid and turpentine. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I really hit the bottom. <laughs> I really hit the bottom. But the arts have kept me, gave me an education. You know, the people in, as artists and, and as uh, actors and, and the people I brought the elbows with gave me an education. Because I only went to three years of grammar school. So as a result, uh, I was kind of a clean slate, you know, open book. And that's the way I live, so you can't change a leopard's spots, that's for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, I think I answered that one, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> different characters you I go play. off, don't I? <laughs> I was out, I was walking on that water out there. With the <laughs> Is there any type of character you haven't done that you'd like to do? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. There's a potter. I know. <laughs> Sorry, guys. There's a great joke. I'm sitting in a restaurant with a beautiful woman, eating food, and she, it finally comes out. What do you like to do uh, other than acting? What do you do for fun? And I go, well, I make pottery. And she goes, pottery? She goes, check please. <laughs> <laughs> Taxi. <laughs> I'm heading out. Okay. Anyway, but the point, what I'm trying to get at is, uh, because I have that to ground me, I, there's a potter that was back in the 1850s down in Biloxi, Mississippi. And his name was George Orr. And he was also uh, way ahead of his time. He lived to about 1900 and they called him the Mad Potter of Biloxi. And I know his whole life story, and I'm just, I'm fascinated by the guy. And I wanna do that movie. I wanna play that guy to make, to make the memory of him not, never disappear. I remember, he was so far ahead of his time, he, he made a pot about that big and about that big around and put his whole life story on it, carved it into it and sent it up to the Smithsonian. And of course, they sent it back. So we don't want it. So, but guess where that pot is now? It's at the Smithsonian. And you, if you tried to buy one of his pots, if it's only this big, it'd be $100,000. Know, so, so he finally made it after his death. You know. He raised 10 kids. And they found his stuff. His sons uh, became car mechanics, you know, right around the 1900s, 1930 maybe. And, they, and some guy from New York came in there and found uh, all his pottery up in an attic, hundreds and hundreds of them, and bought them all. And that was it. Now he was in a gallery in New York. See what happens when you talk about pottery. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Because everybody's saying, oh, I did it in high school. My grandmother did it. A handprint on the clay. It's not that. <laughs> I don't make that kind of pot. But anyway, yeah, that's one of the things I'd love to do. There's a couple of stories that I'd love to do. But I'm going to have to direct that and be in it. It's going to take done. a long time, huh? That's the only way to get them done, a story yeah. like that. Yeah, I'll be doing it in a walker. <laughs> <laughs> They'll CG it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? Yeah? So in, in your various roles, what's the most physically uncomfortable you've ever been while shooting something? Uh, you know, in a tank of water? Are you asking about the pipe scene in Aliens? <laughs> 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 Um, uh, there's been a few others. I mean, I've done, I've done, I did about five westerns in a row, and some of that was just arduous out in the desert. You know, I, I, there's another one I did called Bone Dry, where we're in Death Valley in the summer, wow. and I, and they, of course, they put me in a coat, it was <laughs> hat. You know, that's 135 degrees, and that was everybody around me was passing out. I swear to God. And I, by some miracle, he didn't bother. 
just survived it. The makeup lady passed down. The cameraman passed down. <laughs> and then a flood came, and a flash flood came out of the mountains and took the camera and the dolly and everything and washed it away. <laughs> and I thought, this is a tough movie. <laughs> <laughs> Long one, too. But yeah, I mean, it, it's no different. We're all in the same boat. I think everybody in here could do a movie. I really do. The right part, the right movie, the right stakes, something you can understand. You could uh, kick some mats. <laughs> I like I you. Love the <laughs> um, and if, yeah. yeah. So talking about that, how do you, when when you get a script, what what sets it aside of what you're going to do versus what you're not going to do? Um, I'm a real primitive, so when I get a script, I always have a pen with me or a pencil, and I, and I when I read it, the first images I get, I write down. I write down my reaction. And usually, because I've been doing it quite a while, and usually it's in the right direction. I don't know what I'm gonna do until we get there. I really don't. I memorize it all. So it's in my pocket, you know what I mean? The words. And then everything for me depends on the people I'm dealing with. You know what I mean? I don't I don't I don't I don't do a solo. It's not like, whatever you do, if you set yourself on fire in the middle of the scene, I ignore it and I just do what I was going to do, you know? I don't do that. You would be crazy to do that. That's not so hard. But anyway. But being a primitive, I'm always, I always seem to find a real weird way into it. Because I'm weird. <laughs> you know, I mean, my imagination is weird. But it's okay. I've been to a psychiatrist that said I'm fine. <laughs> it said I'm healthy. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite bishop line? Favorite pickup line? Oh, bishop. <laughs> oh, that too. Sure, <laughs> <Sure>, that too. <laughs> hey, baby, <that's> okay, baby. <laughs> what is my favorite line? A uh, bishop line from Aliens. Oh, bishop. Yeah. I, I can tell you my favorite moment. We got to England to do Aliens. And the, and the British, they thought, how dare Jim Cameron, this young guy, and Jim had a little beard, and they, and they called him Grizzly Adams <laughs> to mock him. How dare him come in and, and try to do a job like Sir, uh, Sir uh, the guy that did the first Aliens. What's his name? Thank you. I did that on purpose. <laughs> Ridley Scott. How dare us come in and try to top Ridley Scott? And the guy, uh, I remember the first time they were calling us to the set, they say, bring in the artists. And I said, what are you, a wise guy? I thought they would put me down. And I've never been called a thespian or an artiste, you know. And I said, what's the matter with you, man? You know, being from New York. I actually said, what's your fucking problem? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, then I start toward the set, and he puts his, he hits my chest. You know, because uh, apparently he was calling us early. And I said, if you ever touch me again, I'm going to beat the shit out of you. <laughs> That's how it all started. That we, were, we were like that for about half the movie, until they started seeing what we were doing. And then we threatened to leave England and go somewhere else and finish the movie. And they did a turnaround, you know. Because yeah. they used to go to the pub on uh, at Pinewood Studios, they had a bar. And I think it was the sister ship of the Lusitania. All the woodwork was that, right? They'd strip that ship out. Why am I telling you this? Because it was the environment. They would go to lunch and have, they'd shoot down four or five pints. Because they only had them an hour. <laughs> so they were like, <laughs> feeding them sucks. <laughs> and then they'd come back and they'd be all, you know, edgy with us. But finally it turned around. And, and, uh, 
we kind of knew what we had because their work was incredible. They, uh, all of the people that worked on, on the practical effects, there are no special. There, there are some rear projections, but everything was practical. Yeah. Everything, including the drop ship. You know, there were some models. And, that, that. Mm -hmm. and uh, they did incredible work over there. Because they were all on, they had been at Pinewood for 30 years, <coughs> and they were craftsmen, and they made these beautiful things. So I liked them. Uh, once I, once we set each other straight, we were good. <laughs> we were good. I'm remembering faces right now. <laughs> they were they were tough. Huh. Anyway, yeah, the movie the movie when it came out, we were all blown away. Yeah, yeah. I think I said to Jim, I, we had a there was a screening at Fox. You know, with Gail Hur and Jim, everybody was there. And we saw the movie for the first time. And I'm like, we're walking out, and I said, uh, Jim, he said, what'd you think, Lance? I said, Jim, I'm going to have to write you a letter, man. I was without words, because the guy, I felt, had done such a tour de force. You know, he had written it. He, he was there before everybody and left after everybody and edited it. He did this amazing movie. But the mistake I made was I never wrote it. I was, I was speechless at how much of a job he did on that movie. And he thought for years I hated it. I had, we cleared the air. I was at his birthday party last year. I said, Jim, I love the movie. I, and this was without words. You ever get that way? You just don't know what to say. It's just like, wow. I don't want to stand there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> you think I was on some kind of Prozac? Well, <laughs> I was say, you talked about your childhood watching movies. As you got on in front of the camera yourself, did you have an opportunity to work with any of those actors? That yeah, you I ended up, believe it or not, I ended up working with uh, with uh, Douglas. We did a one of those things called uh, Tales from the Crook. and Douglas played the general, and I played uh, Sergeant Ripper in the First World War, and and I was on the set with him, and I was blown away that I had come full circle now, because I had watched him in the Big Sky, you know, go out of river on those boats, you know, like flint locks, <coughs> and I thought, oh. and here I am working with the guard. I I didn't tell him. His son was in the movie with him, and, and uh, I didn't want to. His son had a part of playing part of Howard, and I, I uh, have to tell the general who he was. Your son is yellow, you know. <laughs> and, but it was great. It's, a lot of that has happened. Uh, that's what I mean about. I guess we all need uh, a kind of a. A nod saying that we, we did the right thing by going and doing what we've done all our lives. And that when those things happen, it's pretty amazing. You know, I, I wasn't bragging, I was talking about the right stuff and, and NASA. But the best part of that story is that I was standing there and I looked to my at the big podium, and there's a hundred people at NASA sitting there. And I looked to my left and John Glenn is standing there and Sally Ride and a couple of other astronauts. And I got so well done because, uh, you know, Gordon Cooper became a friend of mine, so I, I knew a lot about NASA and about 